Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Today is Calcutta, Kutta Day. Today is, I'm wearing my Festival of the Holy Name t-shirt. You like it? The latest from Alachua. So, Hare Krishna everyone. This class is especially meant for the devotees in New, in Australia. Of course, it may be convenient for many of you. And we had a, we had a class on Calcutta just because. <coughs> excuse me, my god brother Balabhadra was telling me I should understand more about cows, and he gave me things to read from Prabhupada's books. But I heard something today I wanted to relate to you. It was very interesting. And Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada went to um, his last trip to London. I'm not sure when. It might have been late 76 or early 77. I believe it was early 77. And he was having, Prabhupada was having some difficulty. Good timing for Taiwan and China, right? So Prabhupada was having some difficulty, as you know, with the Mumbai project. And um, there were other difficulties he was having, and his our own lawyers were conspiring against us. And it was just like one thing after another. There wasn't a lot of help and a lot of support. Rather, Prabhupada was running into lots of antagonism. So then he came to England and he said something very interesting. He said, in India, I've been given much trouble, but in England or in the West, everything is very nice. Countries are very organized. People are very helpful. People are very nice. So the only, the only problem here is that they eat meat. And then Prabhupada said, he said, can't you convince them to eat something other than the cow? to eat pigs or goats or something other than the cow. That's pretty significant because Prabhupada was allowing these nice people, these Western people, which he said were nice, except that they eat the cow. He said, you're nice people, eat, eat something other than the cow. You'll still be a nice, you'll still be a nice people, just don't eat the cow. So that was quite interesting. You see, um, you, you have you have two like divisions of Prabhupada's preaching. One is he's preaching to us to be Krishna conscious, and then the other one he's preaching to people in general how they can be Krishna conscious. Welcome everyone. Amber Katie, Sundari Radha, Amrita Velasini from Taiwan, Kruti, and whoever else is assembled around the world. So Prabhupada had a vision of how to spread Krishna consciousness around the world. He also had a vision for us, who he was cultivating to become devotees, brahminical, and so forth. So the vision for the average person here was, it's okay to eat meat, just don't eat the cow. And we discussed in the last class on cows that Prabhupada said, we can make allowance even in Mayapur for people to eat meat but not the cow. So I wanted to read some things from the Bhagavatam. This is the first canto, if you want to read along. This is the first canto. It's the 17th chapter. And we were reading from this section previously. Let's read from text... Five. I don't know if we read this. This is Prakshima. She's speaking to the personality of Kali. Personality of Kali is Kali. Kali. We're in Kali Yuga, and this is Kali Yuga. Basically, it's Kali Yuga personified, and he's attempting to kill an animal, which is, of course, is a symptom of Kali Yuga. So, this is what Prakshit Maharaj says, Oh, who are you? You appear to be strong, and yet 
you dare kill within my protection those who are helpless. By your dress you pose yourself to be a godly man, king, but by your deeds you are opposing you are opposing the principles of the twice born Kshatriyas. The Brahmins, Kshatriyas and Vaishyas are called twice born because for these higher classes of men there is one birth by parental conjugation and there is another birth of cultural rejuvenation by spiritual initiation from the bona fide acharya or spiritual master. So a chatriya is also twice born like a brahmana and his duty is to give protection to the helpless. The chatriya king is considered to be the representative of God to give protection to the helpless and chastise the miscreant. So helpless, it doesn't just mean the cows, although this verse refers to the cows, but it means children should be protected, elders should be protected, protected women should be protected, Brahmins should be protected, and cows. So that's the duty of a chatriya. And chatriya is twice born. And Prabhupada says, has said that the education that a chatriya gets is the same education uh, in, as, as all brahmacharis get. So he studies the Shastra, he knows the Shastra. So he knows what is right or wrong, and, he, and he, he knows that he has to take guidance from the Brahmins. And so he knows about cow protection, and so, so Prakshit Maharaj says, you, you, to Kali you're dressed like a chatra, but you're not acting like one. No chatra would, would act this way. Hmm. The Chatra king is considered to be the representative of God to give protection to the helpless and chastise the miscreants. Whenever there are anomalies in this routine work by the administrators, there is an incarnation of the Lord to reestablish the principles of a godly kingdom. In the age of Kali, the poor, helpless animals, especially the cows, which are meant to receive all sorts of protection from the administrative heads are killed without restriction. So the point that's being made here is in a civilized culture where there is a Chatriya king, other an all animals should be protected, but protection of other animals may mean that according to certain rules and regulations they can be killed, but there is no industry, there's no animal meat industry. And cows are not allowed to be killed by anyone. So you know we kind of in, in, we kind of see cows in a sense like human beings that they cannot be killed. Just as in our society, it's illegal to kill a human, but it's not illegal to kill an animal. It's not illegal to kill cows or pigs or goats or shoot deer for sport or other animals, but. In Vedic society, killing a cow is, is, is a serious sin. Serious, serious sin. On, on par, on the level, similar to killing a human being. Or in some places, Prabhupada even said, it's more important, cow protection is more important than Brahminical protection. Or, or no, he said... Uh, Krishna appreciates protection of cows more than Brahmins, or equal, or more. I, I, I forget exactly, but in some place, don't quote me exactly, because I, I, I can't remember exactly, but in some places, Prabhupada said, protecting cows even more than protecting Brahmins, or Krishna appreciates it more, at least equal, at least that we know, and I believe he said more. Such powerful administrators are rulers of the poor citizens by dress or office, but factually they are worthless, lower-class men without the cultural assets of the twice-born. Therefore, in the age of Kali, everyone is unhappy due to the maladministration of the state. The modern human society is not twice-born, by spiritual culture. Therefore, the people's government by the people who are not twice born must be a government of Kali in which everyone is unhappy. 
So Prabhupada's denouncing democracy here. Basically telling us that when you have people who are not qualified, twice born, and then they're voting for someone, who are they going to vote for? Another unqualified person. And so then you have so many problems. Hold on a second. The sun is entering the room. That's worse. Okay. The sun is there, and the morning the sun is here. So we... I have to switch around a little bit. Do the best we can, okay? All right. So, this purport is pretty apropos because we're... Um, we see that uh, we don't have the best leaders and uh, sometimes we don't understand why people would vote for such leaders, but Prabhupada's explaining why. Um, people's government by the people who are not twice born must be a government of Kali. Yeah, so really the Brahmins should choose the leaders. Text 6. You rogue, do you dare to beat an innocent cow because Lord Krishna and Arjuna, the carrier of the Gandiva bow, are out of sight? Since you are beating the innocent in a sacred, in a secluded place, you are considered a culprit and therefore deserve to be killed. So, yeah. So, just so, in this society, if you kill, if you, yeah, as I was saying, killing a cow is equivalent to killing a human because Pariksha Marsh is telling the personality of Kali, if you kill a cow, then I will kill you. That's the punishment. That's what you deserve. Yes? Okay. Let's go over here. We'll get more light. Okay? Is that better? So dark. Yes, better. Something. Yes. Could go outside, but I don't have everything set up. Okay. In a civilization where God is conspicu conspicuously banished, and there is no devotee warrior like Arjuna, the associates of the age of Kali take advantage of this lawless kingdom and arrange to kill innocent animals like the cow in secluded slaughterhouses. Such murderers of animals stand to be condemned to death by the order of a pious king like Maharaj Pariksit. For a pious king, the culprit who kills an animal in a secluded place is punishable by death, by the death penalty, exactly like a murderer who kills an innocent child in a secluded place. So that's because... According to Vedic, according to the Vedas, cows are to be protected just as children and women and elders and Brahmins. So if you would kill any of them, you would, the punishment is that you would be killed. And so it's interesting, right? That cows are given that same position like human beings. Isn't that interesting? And you're asking why? Why is it like that? That means cows are val are so valuable to the human society and so dear to Krishna. So the bull, there was a bull there, and Pariksit Maharaj spoke to the bull. Who are you? Are you a, are you a bull as white as a white lotus, or are you a demigod? You have lost three of your legs and are moving on only one. Are you some demigod causing us grief in the form of a bull? So now the bull represents the cleanliness, austerity. Cleanliness and mercy were gone. It's Kali Yuga. And now you're left only with some truthfulness. You're standing on one leg. Hmm. 
O son of Sarabi, you need lament no longer now. There's no need to fear this low-class shudra. He's speaking, he's saying, you don't have to fear Kali. And mother cow, as long as I am living as the ruler and subduer of all envious men, there's no cause for you to cry. Everything will be good for you. Purport, protection of bulls and cows and all other animals can be possible only when there is a state ruled by an executive head like Maharaj Prikshit. Maharaj Prikshit addresses the cow as mother, for he is a cultured, twice-born Kshatriya king. Surabi is the name of the cows which exist in the spiritual planets and are especially reared by Lord Sri Krishna himself. As men are made after the form and features of the Supreme Lord, so also the cows are made after the form and features of the Surabi cows in the spiritual kingdom. In the material world, the human society gives all protection to the human being, but there is no law to protect the descendants of Surabi. Interesting, right? Who can give all protection to men by supplying the miracle food milk. So here's an animal who supplies us milk, and as we said before, sometimes sages would live only on milk, milk and fruit. So this cow is meant to be protected and taken care of because human society depends or should depend on the cow or can depend on the cow. Of course, you say we don't depend on the cow today, but you know, society is so much different today. It's so artificial, and who knows how long society can exist this way. But in a traditional culture where people didn't live with all the modern technology you had today, they're very dependent on the cow. That's one of the ways they lived. That's how they could live, because of the cow. So that's the point Prabhupada's making here. Um, so you have to give all protection to the cow. Now, another thing, aside, aside from this, and um, we understand that cows are very dear to Krishna, and Prabhupada said this most amazing thing that all the problems in society today are due to the fact that animals, that the cows are not being protected. So that's amazing. Isn't it? That's an amazing statement, just to meditate on that, that all the problems we're facing in society today are due to the fact that cows are not protected. It's amazing. Okay. So, we read more. In the material world, the human society gives all protection to the human being, but there is no law to protect the descendants of Surabi, who can give all protection to men by supplying the miracle food, milk. But Maharaj Prikshit and the Pandavas were fully conscious of the importance of the cow and bull. And they were prepared to punish the cow killer with all chastisement, including death. There has sometimes been agitation for the protection of the cow. But for want of pious executive heads and suitable laws, the cow and the bull are not given protection. The human society should recognize the importance of the cow and the bull and thus give all protection to these important animals following in the footsteps of Maharaj Prikshit. For protecting the cows in Brahminical culture, the Lord, who is very kind to the cow and the Brahmins, Go Brahmana Hitaicha, will be pleased with us and will bestow upon us real peace. So, you know, when, when you're looking at solving a problem, you obviously look at solutions which make sense according to the way you understand how things work in this world. But Prabhupada's explaining here that there are other factors going on. And when Krishna is displeased, even if you do what so-called would be the right thing or what seems to be the right thing, it's going to be problematic. Because unless we're doing things in, in where Krishna is pleased, then there's, there's negative reactions, even, even you're kind of doing the right thing. Um... So Krishna Krishna had something to say. Still, the number of vegetarians or vegans is increasing. Last week we had a vegetarian festival and at least 5,000 people came. When I became vegetarian almost 30 years ago, uh, we were considered freaks. 
Is it not? It's not perfect, but number of killed animals is decreasing. Yeah. Well, of two things that we're looking at, one is not killing animals, and the other is utilizing and protecting, which are which are actually different because vegans aren't really into protecting bulls and cows. I think maybe they would just let them roam freely and not take their milk. And we, in traditional society, you need bulls for dung and for plowing. So there's, excuse me, so there's more to it than just not eating cows, but there's a whole, there's a whole philosophy around the bull and the cow and the bull protects us from industrialization. So, you know, we're looking at it in a different way. And if you kill the bull, then you bring in the tractor. If you bring in the tractor, then you need gasoline. And you eliminate like 20 people working on your farm. And yeah, there's, there's many problems. So that's also how we're looking at it. I haven't written the Shinga Kavacha yet. I was going to ask him about offering the deities some other kind of milk, which I doubt he'll agree with. Let's read one more. The chaste one, the king's good name, duration of life, and good rebirth vanish when all kinds of living beings are terrified by miscreants in his kingdom. It is certainly the prime duty of the king to subdue first the sufferings of those who suffer. Therefore, I must kill this most wretched man because he is violent against other living beings. So Prikshamarj wanted to kill Kali. When there is some disturbance caused by wild animals in a village or town, the police or others take action to kill them. Similarly, it is the duty of the government to kill at once all bad social elements, such as thieves, dacoits, and murderers. The same punishment is also due to animal killers, because the animals of the state are also praja. Praja means one who has taken birth in the state. So this is an interesting point. The Prabhupada is saying animals are citizens of your country. And so government should protect the animals. Of course, in, in some governments we have some protection. If somebody mistreats a pet, uh, that's a criminal offense. But obviously there's not really protection. Any living being who takes birth in a state has the primary right to live under the protection of the king. The jungle animals are also subject to the king, and they also have a right to live. So what to speak of domestic animals like the cows and bulls? Any living being, if he terrifies other living beings, is a most wretched subject, and the king should at once kill such a disturbing element. As the wild animal is killed when it creates disturbances, similarly, any man who unnecessarily kills or terrifies the jungle animals or other animals must be punished at once. Wow. That is, so obviously that includes hunters who are not hunting for food, who have you know, just hunting for fun. By the law of the Supreme Lord, all living beings, in whatever shape they may be, are the sons of the Lord. And no one has any right to kill another animal unless it is so ordered by the codes of natural law. The tiger can kill a lower animal for his subsistence, but a man cannot kill an animal for his subsistence. That is a law of God, 
who has created the law that a living being subsists by eating another living being. Unless we would say you're in the middle of nowhere and there's no other way to live. Thus the vegetarians are also living by eating other living beings. Therefore, the law is that one should live only by eating specific living beings as ordained by the law of God. The Isopanishad directs that one should live by the direction of the Lord and not at one's sweet will. A man can subsist on varieties of grains, fruits, and milk ordained by God, and there is no need of animal food, save and except in particular cases. Yeah, so that's general principle. No one should eat meat in some cases uh, where nothing else is available, then it may be allowed. The illusion king or executive head, even though sometimes advertised as a great philosopher and learned scholar, will allow slaughterhouses in the state without knowing that torturing poor animals clears the way to hell for such foolish kings or executive heads. The executive heads must always be alert to the safety of the prajas, both man and animal, and inquire whether a particular living being is harassed at any place by another living being. So this this brings up an interesting question. Like, should we be involved in politics? Because if we're involved in politics, it would be extremely difficult, at least all of a sudden, to stop the slaughter of animals. So that means if we're a governor or president, then animal slaughter would be going on under our administration because we couldn't just change it. We probably would be assassinated if we tried to change it. Of course, you you would have to educate society, and and over, over time, maybe things could change, over centuries, perhaps, or at least... Uh, decades. And so, should we run for office and, sh- and, and how do we deal with that? Because then we are going to take the karma or the responsibility to some degree for the sins of the people. So that's an interesting question because recently I read an article that one of the Congress women in our country, Tulsi Gabbard, who's a devotee, was thinking about running for president in 2020, which would be extremely interesting if she won. And who she would choose uh, as part of her cabinet. And I'm sure she would choose lots of alternative people who are eco-friendly and against animal killing. And and, and just just the idea of taking that position, should she take that position? Because then, indirectly, she becomes responsible. You might say, but the laws are already there. She didn't enact them. Maybe, to some degree. But um, the answer would be, I think the answer would be, she can make, uh, she can do something to help the sp- spreading of Christian consciousness or open things up more for the acceptance of Krishna consciousness, then it would be worth it. So we'll read some more. The people's government, or government by the people, should not allow killing of innocent animals by the sweet will of foolish government men. They must know the codes of God as mentioned in the revealed scriptures. Maharaj Prichit quotes here that according to the codes of God, the irresponsible king or state executive jeopardizes his good name, duration of life, power and strength, and ultimately his progressive march towards a better life and salvation after death. Such foolish men do not even believe in the existence of the next life. So, as you know, when culture becomes degraded, my wife and I were speaking, I had picked her up at the airport, I'm driving back, and she had met somebody, when she stopped the gas station, she met somebody who is from the deep south of America, and they have a very, very strong accent. And for us who don't have that accent, when someone speaks that way, it kind of has the connotation of someone not educated, which is not necessarily the case, but it has that connotation. And I was saying, I'm saying, you would think if they had that very strong southern accent, which has the connotation like you're just a country boy and not that smart, you'd think they'd want to kind of develop 
a, a more normal accent, like the way I'm speaking. Rather than speaking like that, they would speak like I'm speaking. But they probably don't see anything wrong with speaking the way they speak. Everyone in their neighborhood speaks that way. Or perhaps they even like it. So when you grow up in a certain situation and something is normal, it may not be normal for other people because most of Americans speak more or less like I do. Most of them don't speak most of, because only a small portion from, are from the South or that there's only a small portion population that's considered the South that would speak that way. So, But for them, it's normal and natural. So as we know, growing up in the West, we never associated meat with actual living entities, animals. It was just... So that's, that's a defect of our culture, that we grow up um, insensitive and in not making that connection. So... Um, Prabhupada saying, it's like, he's saying, people don't know these things, and you're electing them in office. This is the worst thing you can do. Someone doesn't understand karmic reaction. They don't understand brahminical culture. They don't understand these higher laws of nature, and you elect them into government. That's a huge problem. While commenting on this particular particular verse, we have in our presence the statement of a great modern politician who has recently died and left his will, which discloses his poor fund of knowledge of the codes of God mentioned by Maharaj Brikshit. The politician was so ignorant of the codes of God that he writes, quote, I do not believe in any such ceremonies, and to submit to them even as a matter of form would be hypocrisy and an attempt to delude ourselves and others. I have no religious sentiment in the matter. So this is, a, you know, this is why Prabhupada was so against atheism and so against science which promoted atheism because it, it basically throws out everything religious, everything, every code of God, every scripture, just throw it out and replace it with so-called human intelligence or so-called human common sense. And then that's what we have today in the world. And that's why it's a disaster. So the goal of the Brahmins and Chatras is, is, is to gradually elevate people on the spiritual path, to take, to take care of them materially, but take care of them materially in such a way they can be elevated spiritually. That's, that's the point. That's the purpose. So, what to speak of doing that, it's actually going the other direction. So, Prabhupada's, you know, so much, you know, we might think, well, atheists, they may be nice people, they're just, they're just uh, confused or ignorant. But when they come into power, then it creates problems because they end up like this politician. Um, Contrasting these statements of a great politician in the modern age with those of Maharaj Prikshit, we find a vast difference. Maharaj Prikshit was pious according to the scriptural codes, whereas the modern politician goes by his personal belief and sentiments. Any great man of the material world is, after all, a conditioned soul. He is bound by his hands and feet by the ropes of material nature. And still the foolish conditioned soul thinks of himself as free to act by his whimsical sentiments. The conclusion is that people in the time of Maharaj Prikshit were happy and the animals were given proper protection because the executive head was not whimsical or ignorant of God's law. Foolish, faithless creatures try to avoid the existence of the Lord and proclaim themselves secular at the cost of valuable human life. In other words, Prabhupada's saying what we already know, but putting it in a political context, he's saying you're a limited human being unless you take guidance from higher authority. 
You're imperfect, so you're going to create problems. And you're basically going to waste your human form of life, and you're going to waste the human form of life of other people, because you don't know how to get out of the entanglement. You don't know how to properly administer government. And now you're in this position where ignorant people like you should not have this authority, and therefore you're going to mess it up. Just like if I ask you to do something, so I have a problem with my car, can you fix it and you come over? And you know nothing about cars and you start pulling things, pulling nuts and bolts off, taking things apart. So it's pretty likely you're going to mess something up when you don't know how to do it. And so democracy, the problem with democracy is there's no demand that leaders be trained. Not, not even trained in Shastra, just trained. There's no standard of training. Well, to speak of training in Shastra. So if you're not trained in Shastra, you're going to mess up. You have to. You just don't know how to do it. That's Prabhupada's point. Mm. Okay. The human life is especially meant for knowing the science of God, but foolish creatures, especially in this age of Kali, instead of knowing God scientifically, make propaganda against religious belief, as well as the existence of God, even though... They are always bound by the laws of God, by the symptoms of birth, death, old age, and disease. So it's, yeah, the every satious in your body. Just anything that's that's pulling people away from adherence and submission to God and religion is destructive for them and destructive for the world. So. If you know anything about science and see the direction it's been going over the last perhaps 100 years, then you can see that it's... You know, or if you study the history of science, there was a time when scientists were godly men, they were religious men. And science just... To them, it just proved God's existence. Now these scientists are so foolish that they're using science to disprove God's existence. So, that, and why? Because if there's no God, you can do anything you want. And if there's no God, you can play with the universe in any demoniac way you want. And if there's no God, then you can set the standards for morality because you're not bound by any religious system. You're not bound by any religious instructions of what is right and wrong. You can decide what is right and wrong, what is, what is best what you think is best for you and best for society that you can deem as right. And then you can do that, whatever that is. And you can create your own set of morality. And so that's where society is going. And that's why atheism is so bad. Because people are not... It's not like we'll get rid of God and then because we're so intelligent and we're so elevated that everything's going to get better. No. Just the fact that you want to get rid of God, it already shows your colors. And your plan is revealed what you want to do. You want to, you want to create a world according to your... You want to create a world according to your ideas. And therefore, you can't have God in the picture because if He's in the picture, then you have to adhere to His rules and His standards and you don't want to. And so... Therefore, you convince people that belief in God is foolish or it's for weak people and we, as humans, can do everything ourselves. And so that's, that's their... That's why Prabhupada was so adamant about how detrimental, how horrible this philosophy is for human society. Mm -hmm. Krishna Koshin says, we had a discussion with my husband a few days ago. My husband said that the ruler of the country, in our case, president of the country, is taking some percentage of karma, yeah, and sinful activities. Yeah, Prabhupada said one-sixth. It seems that all our present presidents of all countries never get out of hell. Well, yeah, we have to deal with one-sixth of the karma. Maybe they get one-sixth of the good karma also. 
have a pious... Yeah, so it's good. So if you engage the people in pious activity, you get one-sixth of their pious activity. So that's good, right? And you engage them in sin, you get one-sixth of the sin. So, um, yeah. Yes. Hmm. He, Marish Brikshit, repeatedly addressed and questioned the Bulldog. So, son of Sarabi, who has cut off your three legs? In the state of the kings who are obedient to the laws of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, there is no one as unhappy as you. Okay, so I'm going to, this is getting more into. Um, what it means to be a king, and so Balabhadra has given me some other quotes to read. We're going to go to 418, 6 through 8. So bear with us. I know for some of you it's boring when I read, but I want you to hear Prabhupada's words. <laughs> Always, always when I read too much, I see the number of people goes down, they get bored. Yeah. All right, we're trying to... Huh. So this is 418, text 6. The Balabhadra told us to read this. I haven't read this yet. Let's see what it says. My dear king, the seeds, roots, herbs, and grains, which were created by Lord Brahma in the past, are now being used by non-devotees who are devoid of all spiritual understanding. This is um, Maharaj Prithu speaking to the earth in the form, who took the form of a bull, and she's saying that I don't want to feed the people, population of the world, because they're all engaged in material activities. So she's like turning off. She's just turning off production. Production is turned off. She turned the switch off. Lord Brahma created this material world for the use of the living entities, but it was created according to a plan that all living entities who might come into it to dominate it for sense gratification would be given directions by Lord Brahma in the Vedas in order that they might ultimately leave it and return home back to Godhead. All necessities grown on earth, namely fruits, flowers, trees, grains, animals, and animal byproducts, were created for use in sacrifice for the satisfaction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vishnu. However, the planet Earth, in the shape of a cow, herein submits that all these utilities are being used by non-devotees who have no plans for spiritual understanding. Although there are, are immense potencies within the Earth for the production for the production of grains, fruits, and flowers, this production is checked by the earth itself when it is misused by non-devotees who have no spiritual goals. Everything belongs to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and everything can be used for His satisfaction. Things should not be used for the sense gratification of the living entities. This is the whole plan of material nature according to the directions of this material nature. In this verse, the words Ashadvihi and Adrita Vratai are important. The word Ashadvihi refers to the non devotees. The non devotees have been described in Bhagavad Gita as Duskritina, miscreants, mudha, asses or rascals, Naradhama, lowest of mankind, and Maya Parhita Jnana, those who have lost their knowledge to the power of the illusory energy. All these persons are asat, non-devotees. Non-devotees are also called grihavrata, whereas the devotee is called dhritavrata. The whole Vedic plan is that the misguided, conditioned souls who have come, to the, have come to lord it over material nature should be trained to become dhritavrata, determined to go back to Godhead. <laughs> Krishna Karshan is saying, if I talk about controversial topics, we'll get more viewers. Yes, controversy. Everyone loves controversy. Activities intended to satisfy the senses of the Supreme Lord Krishna are called Krishnarte Akila Cheshtaha. 
This indicates that one can attempt all kinds of work, but one should do so to satisfy Krishna. This is described in Bhagavad Gita as Yagartha Karma. The word Yagya indicates Lord Vishnu. We should work only for his satisfaction. In modern times, Kali Yuga, however, people have forgotten Vishnu altogether and they conduct their activities for sense gratification. Such people will gradually become poverty-stricken, for they cannot use things which are to be enjoyed by the Supreme Lord for their own sense gratification. If they continue like this, there will ultimately be a state of poverty and no grains, fruits, or flowers will be produced. Indeed, it is stated in the 12th canto of Bhagavatam that at the end of Kali Yuga, people will be so polluted that there will be no longer any grains, wheat, sugar, cane, or milk. Wow! Wow! Did you hear that, everyone? See, we just lost another person. The more you read, the more you lose. The, um, all of you who are still listening, you are must be all Brahmins. You know, like listening to Prabhupada's books. What did Prabhupada just say? He said, because um, the way we're continuing, we're breaking the laws of nature, and so if we continue, this, we're gonna, there's going to be this massive poverty. You know, we're always talking about the gross national product and this and that, and unemployment and the value of the dollar. And this is like, yeah, and Prabhupada's saying, doesn't matter, whatever you do, because you're breaking the laws of nature, at one point, it's all going to crash. And the whole world's going to wonder how to eat. And, uh, yeah, you didn't cultivate the earth well. And uh, now you don't know how to eat. And all your food's coming in from somewhere else. You know, America is just like a huge country, and we're not self-sufficient. Can you believe it? It's such a big country, and we're not self-sufficient. And we can't be self-sufficient because we want things that are too expensive or impossible to make in America. So what a precarious situation we're in, isn't it? You're in a country that can't even feed its own people. That's scary. You should be scared if you live in a country that can't feed your own people. You should be scared if everything you need doesn't grow like within a mile of your house. Because what if something... Disastrous happens. How will you eat? You go, oh no, nothing's going to happen like that. And Prabhupada had predicted economic collapse here. He's predicting that the reaction to our sinful activities will destroy us. Um, what does he say? Yeah, eventually. Well, of course, it's predicted in the Bhagavatam as Kali Yuga progresses, there'll be less rain because there'll be less sacrifice and then there'll be less food. And eventually, there won't be food. Nothing will grow. Then there'll only be animals. And then there won't even be enough for the animals. And there'll only be humans. And the only way humans can survive is if they eat one another. Hare Krishna. Yeah, that's the... Uh, you know. Orson Welles had 1984. We have 2084, 2184. I don't know when it's going to happen. 5084, 10,084. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have a question, sort of on this topic. Octavian says, How can Krishna feel compassion if he knows not what suffering is? Well, Devotee can, the devotee knows better about suffering than even Krishna knows. But Krishna's nature is compassion. So it's just his nature. So he doesn't have to experience it to have it because he just has it. Because that's what it means to be God. It means to be compassionate. And Krishna's compassion is manifested through the Brahmins to the Kshatriyas. So the Kshatriyas become like the body, the arms. They become the arms of Krishna and the Vaishyas become the, excuse me, the Brahmins become the brains of Krishna. So they, they carry out his compassion. Ah. Hmm. 
So why we can just say Krishna is made of compassion. So Wilfred, the one and only Wilfred Flores, has is going to tell us something about meeting. Wilfred is in the, he helps in the Bhakti Center. Meat eating is pretty controversial as big meat and dairy farms contribute more to climate emissions in the earth than big oil does. Yes. And who knows how much they contribute to campaign con contributions and such. Anyway, Prabhupada said there's no strong leaders. The leaders would stop these things. But now leaders can't stop it because someone will shoot the leader. Anyway, we're and we we have to suffer for all of this, unfortunately. Yeah. So we're having festival of the holy name at the temple. And is it okay if I end class here? Because I have nothing controversial to say to keep you interested. And maybe Calcutta is not the most interesting topic. But, um, yeah, we read a little bit, so it's nice to read and hear what Prabhupada is saying. And we'll, Maybe we can end on this thought that you see from reading these purports that how much Prabhupada is thinking about the welfare of everyone. And you know, how much he's thinking about not just making a few people Krishna conscious, but actually thinking about restructuring society. Prabhupada's thinking about protecting animals. He's thinking about all the poor citizens who have to live in America governed by such foolish leaders and, or live in your country governed by such foolish leaders. He's, he's feeling bad for, for all these people who have to uh, exist under the administration of unqualified people. So it shows where, you know, his mind is, is he's not just thinking, I'll, I'll meet a few people and they'll become devotees, but he's thinking about the whole society. Yes. Well, I had to pick up my wife. I left at 10 this morning. I stopped and did shopping. I bought a... I bought a... Uh, I this holds an iPad or a tablet on a on the uh, mic stand, so you can read what you have to sing, or you can read it while you're recording something. And then I picked up my wife. whose flight was late, and then because it's Thanksgiving weekend, it normally takes two hours to get back, and it took three and a half. So I was gone from 10 a.m. I gave class this morning, as you know. That ended at 8.30. I went in the house, took care of business, watered our plants, had some prasadam, and actually I didn't have prasadam. I did some email, and then I had very small little something on the way, and I just got back at 4.30. I gave this class, and now we're going to go to the Festival of the Holy Name. So... And then we'll see you tomorrow at 8. Hopefully, I will remember to bring everything and I can get a connection. Okay? Hare Krishna to everyone. We will see you, hopefully, tomorrow.